Hey, Sean, you got a little emotional? I got emotional over there. Because, you know, as a, as, as a pastor, as a spiritual father, you're now seeing people getting baptized for the first time in their life. Um, and the significance and the meaning of that for them personally. And it brings back memories of myself being water baptized um, more than once because I had issues. <laughs> I needed to get it again because I came up and I was still very much alive in the flesh. Anybody in the house? <laughs> um, hopefully we won't have to do a third time, right? <laughs> but hey, it could be one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost, right? Holy Spirit. So, um, But what I want to do today, I think, um, is what I feel like I'm led, because it's the scripture that dropped in my heart while I was down there panicking, um, is this. Can I read out of the scripture to them? I'm going to need my glasses because I can't blow up my pages like I do on my screen. So, um, do my eyes look big? (laughs) You guys look big. (laughs) It's like you guys are being magnified 300 times right now. Yes. Why don't we pray? (laughs) Father, we just come before you right now. We just thank you for just visiting us today. Father, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for um, the closing out of worship, and it's such an amazing, inspired word by Sean. Father, for the baptisms today, and Lord, I pray you got a sense of humor, and so Lord, I'm going to pray for your grace to speak today with no notes, um, and I just pray that you have your way with me. And Father, more importantly, as I as I do my best, Lord, I just pray that you would rest upon each person in this place today, no matter where they're at in their life, no matter whether they're in a valley, a mountaintop, or in between, that, Father, you are here for each and every one of us. You're here to reveal your love and your mercy and your grace to us through your son, Jesus, and we thank you for that. So, Holy Spirit, continue to move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um... Oh, hey! My wife got it up. So I, I, I closed it because I'm already here, and I, I'm missing now eight minutes, and I wouldn't have gotten that done. Um, and besides, we're, we're, we're talking about praise this week. This is what we're supposed to talk about, but we'll talk about it next week. But anyways, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. We'll pick up there, and I'll stop, I think, when the Lord tells me to. <laughs> we might be reading to Revelation tonight. No, today. <laughs> well, it would be nighttime, wouldn't it? Okay, it says this. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. How many ungodly people are here today? How many of you realize that you needed Christ to die for you? Because we were there once before. And even though we have Christ and he's died for us, we still do ungodly things. For scarcely, and by the way, I'm reading from the New King James, which I wish I had the New Living Translation. Uh, For scarcely for the righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God, everybody say, but God, God. demonstrated his own love towards us, then in, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Come on, I'm going to read that again. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll stop there for just a moment. You know what's amazing about that is Christ didn't have to die. You know what's amazing about that? A holy God who created us, right? Let's let's understand. God created mankind. He created us in his image. And you go back to Genesis chapter 2. Don't quote me on that because I have no notes, remember? Genesis chapter 2, when he created man, chapter 1, chapter 2, maybe chapter 3. When he created man, he said he created man out of the dust. But more importantly, he formed and fashioned him. But more importantly, he breathed into man his spirit. And at that moment, man was now alive. And it wasn't alive like we are alive. He was fully alive with the Spirit of God in him. And we were talking about this yesterday in in the men's breakfast, that when Adam and Eve walked through the cool of the day, they were in a complete, perfect relationship with God. There was no sin. There was nothing in that way. And because of that, Adam and Eve were both clothed, if you study it out, clothed in the glory of God. 
the glory of God was actually Adam and Eve's covering. That's why they didn't notice they were naked. And then we know that the serpent came, deceived them, they sinned, they did what? The one thing that God said not to do, they did, right? So don't think that God has a whole bunch of rules and regulations. They did the one thing, and that was don't eat that fruit from that tree, and you'll be well, you'll do well. But they did, and they sinned, and immediately that clothing of his glory disappeared. And they realized that they were naked. Now listen, God is a holy God. In him, everything that he does, everything that he thinks, all of his judgments, all the things that he chooses to do is perfect because he's holy. There's no error in God. Now the truth is we can view there's error when bad things happen to our life. Okay, now we're going to get serious here. Sometimes when we have bad circumstances come into our life, many times we end up blaming God for that. But the truth of the matter, just like Adam and Eve had an adversary, we have an adversary. Whether you're in here today and you're a Christian or not, you have an adversary, and it's the same adversary. It's not a different adversary. It's the same adversary. So that adversary, known as the devil, does this for us Christians. He doesn't want us having a relationship with the Lord. And so he tries to distract us and distract us and tries to throw things that, we, that he knows is our weaknesses before us all the time to keep us in a place where we're not pursuing God or going after God or walking with God as Adam and Eve did. If you're here today and you're an unbeliever, the enemy got you, has you right where he wants you, away from God. And when we're away from God, and I can speak for this myself, even though I grew up in the church all my life, I was a professional going to church, but yet not really being in a relationship with God. Come on. We can be, churches can be full of people who know how to play the game. They know how to be a Christian on Sunday morning, but they don't know how to be a Christian Monday through Saturday. That was me. Now, I wasn't off doing crazy things. Come on. I wasn't, but I wasn't right with God, even though I went to church. So, and this is another problem without having notes. Thoughts come and go. <laughs> what was I saying? This is my time to test you. What was I saying? This is me testing you on, are you listening? Oh, bad things happen to good people. Thank you. Somebody was listening. <laughs> but sometimes when we're away from God and we're not in a relationship with him, the enemy does bad things. Because he wants you to keep thinking that, that there's a God that doesn't love you. And yet... God didn't have to send Jesus to this earth to make a way for fallen sinful man to come back in a right relationship with God. Jesus said this when he was walking, walking um, the face of the earth and, and, and uh, doing what he did. He said this, no one comes to the Father except through me. Which means this, there's only one way to God. Only one way, and that's through Jesus. Man, the devil, has created numerous ways to get to God. But they're not actually Jehovah. They're not actually Yahweh. They're a false God. They're a false security. And so man and the devil creates these avenues that distort who God really is and take us on a journey that doesn't actually lead us to the real God, to Jehovah God. It leads us to a false security and a false God who's nothing more than an image. And God didn't have to send Jesus. So why did God have to send Jesus? Because he loved us. In all of our errors and all of our mess ups and all the things that we've done that he would call sin, and listen, this is important for all of us today in this place. We don't get to decide what sin is, God does. Because what happens is if we decide what sin is, we actually begin to live in sin, calling it good. Right? God is the one who determines what sin is because he's the Holy One. And so, because God chose to send Jesus, he chose to take a look at our sin and go, I'm going to do something about that. And here's the thing. It didn't matter who you are, what you did, your status in life, your body type. It didn't matter. Jesus came to die for all. And, and we all know Jesus, uh, John three sixteen for God so loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but could have an opportunity for eternal life. And that's a paraphrase on my part, Right. 
Uh, but we don't often quote verse 17, and I don't know it by heart like I know that one, but I know a good, good, a good thing. Jesus, and it says, and this is a paraphrase, Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn the world. Come on. If Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn the world, then why does the church go out and condemn people who are in the exact same spot we've been in our own life, but Jesus came in? So because God loves us, he sent Jesus to die for us. Come on. While, everybody say while, while, we were still sinners. So watch this. Jesus died for humanity while humanity was still steeped in its sin. Do you know that God doesn't care what you've done? Can I just be that bold to say, no matter what you've done in your life, God doesn't care. And you know why he doesn't care? Because whether it's this, whether it's fornication, whether it's adultery, whether it's other sexual sins, or whether it's murder, whatever we could come up with in our mind, Jesus' blood is greater. Jesus' blood is stronger. There's nothing we can do that will keep us away from God's grace, love, and mercy. If there was, God wouldn't have sent Jesus. But Jesus came while we were still sinners. And here's the thing. What that tells me is this. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Come on. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. The truth of the matter is, we've all had issues of particular sins maybe that we struggle with, that maybe they're just a weakness that we have, right? Right? And yes, there's times we, we walk in victory and there's times the enemy comes hard against us to get back into those old patterns and things like that. But here's the truth of the matter. As a believer, without Jesus active and living in our life, we will always struggle with particular sins. Listen, Jesus' blood is greater than any particular sin we can struggle with. It really is. But sometimes it comes really just down to us surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it, it, it's surrendering to God's grace. And I don't think we understand God's grace very well in the church. I think God's grace sometimes is just this idea that we could do whatever we want. And it's all good with God. And it really isn't. Because God, God is like, hey, you know what? I sent my son to die for you. You've accepted me as your Lord and Savior. Now I've put my spirit in you. There is an expectation for you to change because my spirit is not some, some cheap gadget or some cheap toy. It's the living God that comes in us. And and when his spirit comes in us, his Holy spirit comes in us. His spirit is there to help us walk day in and day out and, and now be more like him. And, and, uh, and sometimes we, yeah, sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we say something wrong to our spouse in a, yeah. Anyone? Anyone? I'm going to call some, I'm going to call somebody out right now because I see somebody like this. I'm not going to tell you who, but he knows who he is. No. <laughs> Listen, we do bonehead things. But God's good, and his grace is amazing. And for, for me, his, to, to study out his grace and really just settle with this, that his grace is so amazing that it's not this concept that I can keep on sinning, right? That, that's a fleshly doctrine. It's a doctrine, I'm going to say it's a doctrine of demon, right? But to understand his grace and understand that his grace has been given to us, and it's actually the ability to live the way he wants us to. It's it's not our ability, because if it was our ability, we wouldn't need Jesus, right? It's his ability put in us now to live the very life that he wants us to live. It's not hard. It's just that concept's not hard. The hard part is surrendering to the work of that grace. That's the hard part. Come on. And yet, Christ came while we were still sinners and died for us. 
Then it goes on, verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Come on, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, and that means women too, because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to many. Come on. But the free gift is not like the, oh, I'm sorry, verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the old one, the old who sinned, for the judgment which condemned with the, for the judgment which comes from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which comes from many offenses resulted in justification. Come on, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life Jesus. through the one Jesus Christ. That was a lot, and it takes a Bible education that's beyond mine to understand all, <laughs> to understand all that. No, but I, I want to just stop right there where it talks about being justified. And I know maybe some, some of you in here today might be going, I already know this. Well, good. I'm glad you already know it. You need to hear it again. <laughs> because we always have to be, re- hey, there's some scripture. We always have to remember where we come from and the work of the cross and the work of what Jesus has done for us. But for us to be justified simply is this. It's, it's where God makes us holy as if we've never sinned before. Think about that. You could be in the world today and, and you could be just be living your life and doing all sorts of things. But when Jesus comes into your life, he actually erases everything that's been done. Come on. As if you've never sinned. He justifies you. In other parts of Romans, it says he redeems you. How many have ever won the lottery? But let's just say... You went to a baking raffle. <laughs> Anybody ever been there before? You know the churches that do bake raffles? You know, everybody, all the ladies and some men bring, bring treats and stuff like that, and they raffle them off. And so you get a ticket. And if your number's called, you're hoping it's the best one there. But usually it's not. You know, it's usually the worst thing there. Not saying that anybody in here would bake anything bad, right? (laughs) Don't do anything with tofu. It doesn't work out very well. (laughs) If there's any tofu lovers in here, forgive me. (laughs) But let's say your number gets called, right? You need to go redeem that thing, right? It's, It's been paid for. And that's really what Jesus did for us. He paid the price for our sin. Sins that we couldn't cover, sins that we couldn't erase or or take away, Jesus redeemed it by going to the cross. He redeemed it by, by dying for us on the cross. He redeemed it because he loved us so much that he would do that for us. That, that then not just redeeming it, he would justify us as if we've never sinned before. To me, that's just mind boggling. Who does that? God. But when we really start thinking about it, how humbling is it, no matter if you're not even a Christian here today or whether you've been a Christian for 50, 60, 70 years, how humbling it is to keep on our forefront of our mind 
the work of the cross, the work of what Jesus has done. You know, when we keep that before us, it's pretty hard to get puffed up. It's pretty hard to be prideful because to keep the cross before us and the work of reconciliation and the work of justification had nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. It's hard to get all, look at me. I'm the greatest gift the world has ever seen next to Jesus, of course. If I walked in those days, we wouldn't need 12 disciples because they would only need me. (laughs) Some people walk around like that. Sorry, this is what happens when you don't have notes. My wife's going to lecture me later. Don't ship, don't, don't, don't don't shoot from the hip again. But who does that? Who would go to the cross? Who would, would be beaten? And I don't need to go into the gore of being crucified. Um, if, if you don't know what that looks like, the Passion of the Christ did a phenomenal job kind of depicting it and how it would happen. Um, but it was gruesome. And he did it for us because his love was so great that he wanted a people. That he would want a people for himself. That he'd be able to snatch out of the grips of hell. To be able to snatch out of the grips of the enemy. And through Jesus, bring us in a proper relationship once again. And you know when, (laughs) and when we come into that proper relationship again, the same spirit that clothed Adam and Eve, that same spirit, that same glory is now inside us. And, and the Holy Spirit is doing a work in us to change us day by day. Glory to glory. Come on. A little bit here, a little bit there. I've always said this, be cautious of the big steps. Because in my life where there's been big steps or what I thought was big steps ended up being more, nothing more than my flesh doing a work that only lasts for a short period of time. God is a God of baby steps. And he will bring you from the worst of pits to the greatest of heights. He will bring you from from bondage to sin and unforgiveness to being set free. We kind of joke a little bit here about becoming a Christian. Because all of us in here who's been there, we've gone through the journey and we are all on a journey. We'd all say it wasn't easy. It's not easy. When God says you have unforgiveness for this person and you don't want to admit it, God's going to work on that area. And he's going to reveal it to you out of his perfect love and grace. See, there's nothing like him in all this world. And as I look across this room, I'm assuming we all have fathers because it takes a father to be here, right? Whether you know that father or not, there was a father involved. But God is a perfect father. He's not like any earthly father. There's nothing on this earth that can compare to the glory of God. There's nothing on this earth that can compare to his goodness. And so we grow up and we go through relationships with, with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and boyfriends and girlfriends and friends and, and, and what have you. And in all those relationships, we walk away with some sort of a picture of who God is especially with our earthly father, especially if you're here and you're married, we get a picture by the relationships we have with other people. And for the ladies in here, I want to just encourage you that God is perfect in being a father. It doesn't matter what your father did to you. It doesn't matter. No, hold on. Let me back up. It does matter what your father did to you. But God can heal it. It doesn't matter whether there's been physical, sexual, or verbal abuse. God can heal you. God can set you free. Men in here, and I know we're all tough, and we're like, I got this, right? We get affected the same way by our earthly father. Come on, I, I know some of your stories. I know what you've gone through. But can I say this, men? God is more gentle than our earthly father. He's perfect. And even how he corrects us. I've been corrected a lot by God. 
Okay? Can I say this? Not once has it ever been harsh, and it's always been gentle. That's the God we serve. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. That's the God of the universe. But we get this image of who God is by our earthly relationships, and we project that on a perfect God. And the enemy actually uses relationships to keep us distorted from who God really is. Sometimes, ladies, if if we come from broken marriages, even our marriage with our husband becomes something where we project on God. And I just want to say this, ladies. God will always be for you and never against you. I want to say this. It doesn't matter. i got to stop saying that. That's not right. It does matter because there is hurts and there is things that we go through, all of us as guys and girls. We go through hurts based on relationships. And I don't mean to diminish that because that's not my heart. But, but I want you to understand, what you've experienced, God can still heal. God can actually bring freedom. God can actually bring joy. And I know, I know talking with ladies in here, there's been some, some not good marriages. But let's not take those and project onto God earthly images. Let's see who God is for who he is. That's loving. That's sending his son to the earth to die for you and me and all the world to be able to say one day or have the opportunity to come back into a right relationship with him. And obviously we're, we're, we're in a room of people today, but we've all had to face that in some time in our life. We've had to face either going, okay, Jesus, I surrender. Or we may go, not now. Come on, sometimes that's the answer. Sometimes like, no, I want to continue doing what I'm doing. And you know what? God will keep loving you. And he'll keep sending people in your life to reveal to you Jesus. Because he loves you. He desires you. He desires to take you, to restore you, to put his spirit in you, to pour his grace and lavish his love upon you to begin to heal all the emotional wounds and damages that life brings. Come on. That's the God we serve. And that's why we have baptisms. We have baptisms because people come into a right relationship with God. And it signifies simply this. When you go down in the water, it signifies us dying to our old life. Because we all have it. We all have an old life. And I don't care if you were raised like I was in the church all your life. You still have an old life. (laughs) But when you come up, you're coming up in new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I think. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are becoming new. And I like that understanding that all things are becoming new. Doesn't mean you come up out of the water and you're Jesus or doesn't mean you come up out of the water and you're holy. It means God's going to take you through progression because he's going to heal you step by step. He's not going to attack and go, we're going to do this all in the next week. We got 40 years to deal with, but we're going to do it in a week. That's not Jesus because he knows it would kill you. So he's so gentle, he starts doing one thing at a time, bringing health and healing to that one thing. And then we're going to jump into another thing. And yet all the way he's loving us, even all the way we still screw up and he's still loving us and he's still pulling us forward with him. That's God. I got 30 seconds left, so I think we should probably stand up, bow our heads, and I'll do a three-hour prayer. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Let's let's bow our heads. You know, I'm going to ask today, and I I don't do this to try to embarrass anybody, but if you're here today uh, for the first time, and maybe you don't know Jesus, I would like to give you an opportunity if you want to, to know him today. He's ready. Actually, it's probably safe to say he's been ready, and he does desire you. And one thing he will never, ever do is make you do something. Because this decision has to be a decision of our own will. 
God's so respectful of you that he won't force you to do anything, and I won't force you to do anything. And so I want to do this today with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today, and, you're like, and you would say, you know what, my, I don't know Jesus. My life is kind of a mess as I look back over it. And there's a tugging on your heart, and you want to know Jesus today. Would you slip your hand up? Because God is so good. He will meet you right here. And he will pour his spirit out in you. Thank you, Jesus. So maybe you're here, and you've also been a Christian for a long time, but Maybe you've lost track. Maybe you've gotten off track. I understand that because I've been there before. I've been that prodigal son. My heart goes out to you because I understand it. And so if you're here today and maybe you say, you know, I've gotten off track. And I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And I want to make it right again today. Would you be willing to just be bold to say, that's me and raise your hand? Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to pray here in just a moment. But I'm going to ask those that raise their hand, if you would be just bold enough after I pray, pray that you come up and respond to this because there's something about responding to God. There's something about saying, Lord, I raised my hand. Now I'm going to step out and I'm going to show you how serious I am right now. And, and I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're going to dismiss and, and that. But I'd like to have you, and we'll have some people here to pray with you. Okay? If it's a rededication, man, we're going to stand with you. We're going to believe with you that in, in, in 15 minutes, life is going to be different for you. Come on. And you're going to get a fresh new start. Okay? okay? So if you raise your hand after I'm done praying, we're, I'm going to ask you to come forward. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for Tyler, for Mike, for Shauna, for Mitch, Lisa, boldly declaring today that they're your child and that they're following you. Father, what a milestone, what a marker in our life as a believer to always remember this day and the impact that you had as they were coming up out of the water. And for each and every person, it was different, Lord, but it was genuine, it was real. We thank you for that, Lord. And we just pray, Father God, that from shooting from the hip to the worship, Lord, to, to everything that's gone on in this place today, Lord, that your name was glorified, that it was lifted up, that, Father, right now, no matter where we're at, your spirit will invade our hearts that, Father, you will bubble up inside us and that you'll, you'll continue to do the work that you're doing in all of our lives, that you'll continue, Lord God, to reveal yourself more and more to us, that you'll continue to work on us, that, that Father, you'll continue to reveal, to forgive, to love, to grant mercy. Father, we're believing for great things. We're believing for lives to be changed forever and eternal. And Father, right now we just lift, and if you'll agree with me, church, Father, right now we lift up in this place souls to be saved. Father, right now we lift up as we're praying that, Lord, you will bring a hundred people who have never known you into your kingdom through this church. That, Father, they could get rooted and grounded and discipled and, and raised up, Lord God to know who you are and to live for you. Father, we stand and proclaim today, Lord, that you are a good God and it is your heart that all men be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And yet, Father, you, you've empowered your church to be part of that process. You've empowered us to do the work, to be your hands and feet. And so, Father, I pray for boldness on all of us, Lord, that we would be actively looking and being led by your spirit to those, Lord God, that you are working on right now in our culture in our city, in our county, Lord. Father, I thank you that you are working everywhere across the face of the earth, your spirit on hearts that don't know you, hearts that are away. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, here we say, come on, 
we say here, Lord, here we are. Use me. We ask these things in Jesus' name.